Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 332 for May 20th of 2016. Corvette Racing, ground pounding American Thunder. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, I'm kind of flying solo uh, today on today's show. Gary Vasilash is not here. I think he's out on the West Coast on the Mazda CX-9 intro. But I got my great colleague, Mike Austin from Autoblog here with me. So you're, good. you're my co-pilot today, All right, Mike. thanks for having me. Oh. Yeah, yeah, great. And of course, we got to let everybody know, if you don't know already, we got Doug Fian with us. He's the general manager of Corvette Racing. And Doug, it's so awesome to have you here. It's, it, it's always a pleasure. And, and the fact you two guys are flying, I appreciate being up here in first class. <laughs> <laughs> so you're getting ready, right? You got a big race coming in. You're, you're putting all your body armor on. You're, you're getting all the ammunition together for the next 24 hours of Le Mans. You know, it's, it's something that I wish everybody could see. I was at the shop this morning and uh, we're in that final prep mode of getting the cars and the equipment ready to fly over to Le Mans. And to watch something of that size, that magnitude, and the precision at which these guys carry this function out is, is mind-boggling. It's like a military campaign. This will be, I think, our 17th consecutive year at Le Mans. Wow. If we've learned nothing, we've learned how to prepare, pack, and transport our stuff. It is, it's, it's choreographed. It's like a giant dance routine to see all these things. I'd love to have a stop, you know, st- a, a time lapse camera up there to just watch and see how these guys do it. You know, the Cadillac guys are, I think they're off in Mosport this weekend, someplace racing. So we use the Cadillac Bay as a staging platform. And then we move back and forth from bays as the trucks get loaded, as the cars get done. It's a fun thing. It's as much fun for me watching them load that up as it is to race it almost. In fact, I, I took a tour of the facility uh, at Pratt & Miller a couple of years mm-hmm. ago, and don't you have, like, uh, these radio frequency ID tags, RFID tags, like on every tool and everything, so that you know when the truck leaves the, the facility, you know electronically you can measure you got everything on board. Everything is, is cataloged in such a way that, that you the likelihood of you forgetting something is pretty rare. Mm-hmm. A couple that, like I said, with the experience that we have. That's not to say that it runs at 100%, but it's pretty close. You only have to be, and I think you were at Lamar last year and looked at our setup. Yeah, and, I, got, I got a garage tour. It was amazingly organized. Everything and, was perfectly in place, even yeah. during the race when things go haywire. You know, I, I think this year the U.S. is supplying, as a country, supplying more cars to compete in that event than any other country Why in the world. Why is that? Why is that? Well, I just think that, that, that the, the passion that the Americans have for this event, the competitors, not necessarily the fans, Lamar is huge every place but in America, uh, it d- drives that. And, and anybody who spends their lifetime in this business of road racing knows that Lamar is the holy grail. That's where you go. That's your bucket list deal. That's for fans. It's also for competitors. And that's why I see, think you see, I think this year we have 11 cars on the grid registered in America. And, you know, th- this has been building over the last 10 years or so, more and more American yes. presence at, yep. at Le Mans. And uh, because you, you go back 20 years ago and there wasn't a whole lot of much of anything oh, oh, no. in the U.S. No, no, there's virtually nothing. I mean, it, it's... The, the, I don't want to give Corvette credit for that, but I'm going to give Corvette credit for that, all right? We went over there as the outsider, and and we knew we had a huge challenge in winning over the fans and the sanctioning body, and we worked very hard to do that. We've obviously had a fair degree of success there. We've taken Corvette from an obscure American brand, and, and we've become fan favorites uh, in the town of Le Mans. They They love Corvette. They love the Corvette guys. As I was saying, when you, when you walk through that pit lane, I can tell you this. You need something, you come to Corvette to get it. 
because they know we got it. So of all the teams that are there, the U.S. based teams, when they figure out what they've forgotten, they come right down to get us. And we serve as kind of like the Red Cross for all the American racing teams there. <laughs> so I was going to ask you about the fans, though, because it seems like Corvette is the French love the Corvette. And, you know, like almost like in, in the whole race out of all the mm -hmm. classes that doesn't come from like just some years of strange French obsession with the Corvette. It, it, let me <laughs> I'll give you just a short story if we got yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, this. Yeah, this is a good story. Before we went over for our first year, I had a marketing manager, Gary Claudio, who was a brilliant, passionate, funny, charismatic guy. So he says, you know, we're we're coming from a little deficit here getting over there. Number one, we're Americans. It's France, different language. Corvette doesn't have a great reputation over there. I mean, quite frankly, when we did the market research, Corvettes were owned by pimps, prostitutes, and drug dealers. <laughs> That's who drove Corvettes in France. Not exactly the shining example of your demographic. So we knew we had an uphill battle. So he says, we got to think of something. I said, well, what do you got in mind? He says, I got something in mind. He says, I, it'll be pretty simple. I'll, when we get over there, I'll show you what it is. I said, okay, fine. So we get over there. Here's the deal. You go through scrutineering, which is a, which is a whole glorious two days of the, in downtown Lamar. The cars are transported into the square. Thousands of people are gathered around to see the cars and the pilots and, and, and all the stuff. So when you get done moving through this serpentine of, of, of technical inspection, they have a huge area that's set up, and the official photograph for the race is taken there. It has a big Lamar background, and the cars are set up, and the, uh, every member of the team is set up in back. There's a huge uh, podium set up where the photographers are all looking down. The fans are all around. So we get there, get the cars all staged. We're all standing there. We got our baseball caps on, our Corvette, and we're standing proud. And the photographers, of course, are pretty dismissive. You know, they take the compulsory photograph. Uh, I, 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 Go, 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 go. I said, no, 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 one minute, one minute. What we had done was Gary had bought a bunch of berets and some fake mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got done, all right, we took off the ball caps, took out the berets, put on the berets and the fake mustaches and stood there for the final photograph. Now, two things happened. The crowd broke out in applause. Now, this is, this is with no prompting. I mean, they're whistling and clapping, and, and they love The photographers are on this, this podium thing that's suspended. They were laughing so hard they couldn't take the pictures. The thing started <laughs> shaking. They had to wait till it stopped shaking to get the photographs. The next day, we were above the fold in wow. the Sarf Region newspaper. Wow. That was year one there. That was the beginning of the reinvention and reforming of Corvette in Le Mans. That following year, when we went back, Okay, when you look storefront windows in downtown Le Mans all take on. This is a huge deal in that city. This they live every year for this event. This is their town, this 24 hour race. So they always have these little panoramas painted in the windows. About half the stores that had those panoramas featured the Corvettes. You know when you're embraced like that that you've at least made it over the top of the hill. And the rest has pretty much been history. They, lo they love us. Each year we try and do something very special that no one's done before. You know, these cars are cordoned off at that, at that scrutineering. And, and the teams are just, do not get near it. You just stay away. And, uh, you know, we don't want pictures taken. I said to our guys, we're not going to operate like that. When we get there, there's not going to be any ropes. I said, you see kids, you get them in, get them inside the car. Let them have a picture taken. Bring their parents up. We did that that first year, and I can tell you the parents were almost frightened. They were very reluctant because it was something that was totally foreign to them. They had never had this happen. Again, the kid gets in the car. He's just beaming. The parents are taking pictures. They're smiling. When we left that day, Corvette had moved from we don't like them, we never heard of them, to they're our team. And the rest is history. That momentum, you've been you're very astute in recognizing how they love those things, which they do. They do, but, you know, another thing is people love success, and you guys have an amazing success record there. You, you have, what, 16 races yeah. continuously, right? And you've yes. got, what, eight wins? Eight, eight wins. You know, I don't want to diminish the importance of that, but that is really the frosting on the cake. What that did was, in these people's minds that had embraced Corvette, it justified their love of the car. In their mind, not only was it something they loved about the people, but they loved the product because the product have proved its worthiness 
by winning their event. And that is what has compounded that love and affection that they have for us. I, I got to tell you another thing, having been at the race myself, at night, you know, and I'm sleeping at the track, and you hear all the cars <laughs> buzzing around, and the Audis, when I was there, it was uh, uh, the diesel uh, hybrid. Mm -hmm. You couldn't hear anything. I mean, it was wind noise. That was about it. <laughs> right. The Ferraris all wound out, other cars all wound out, and that Corvette comes through, and it's like this thundering trumpet section in a symphony. You can hear it miles away. So there, there's a, a visceral thing, too. So wow. Yeah, you see it. Yeah, you've done these great things to endear yourselves to the French people. Yes, you've got a winning record. But I'm telling you, there's something about even the sound of the car stands it apart from everything else. I refer to that as ground-pounding American thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they have embraced that as well. It's a sound they never hear because there's no vehicles that are produced there that m make that noise, you know, that's, they're in love with Harley for the same reason, because it pounds out, they love that noise, it's just a rarity for them, and you're exactly right, that plays a huge role in, in our love for that. Yeah, we'll be there, this is our 17th consecutive year, which is a modern day record for the same brand being represented by the same team. Hmm. Nobody's nobody's done that. Have you that's, had? That's a that's saying a mouthful because Porsches have been there. But, but it's always been different teams. Mm -hmm. Same with Audi. Got to remember, the Champion was involved in the in the in the early days, and they and they brought cars. It's always been Pratt and Miller, and it's always been Corvette. And this is the 17th consecutive year for that. So we're pretty proud of that. Yeah, and and that's got to be another reason the French love you too. Is you, you're not just a flash in the pan. You've embraced this race, and now they've embraced you. You know, it, it just dawned on me here, and, and this isn't meant to sound egotistical, because this is a statement for our team. But in 2014, much to my surprise, I had never anticipated this, I was selected to receive the Spirit of Lamar Award. Wow. All right. Now, that is, there's, that's, first of all, to be American to get that. Do you get uh, a kiss on each cheek? I got a kiss. <laughs> and a hug. <laughs> And by the way, a brand new Rolex. Yeah. <laughs> that, that notwithstanding, um, you know, that, I, I think that really says it all, to have the passion and the dedication, and that's what that award is about. I just happen to be the guy that received it. It was the team and, and people like Gary Claudio and Danny Binks and all our engineering staff and, and all the guys who grunt every day, the guys who drive the transporters. I mean, the people who are just shoulder to the wheel that have the, the passion and the love for that brand. That's what that award really was the embodiment, and uh, I was proud to receive it on their behalf. That says how far we've come. When you can do that in that world, you know you've arrived. And as a team, we've done that. So, so like John said, you guys have eight wins, and I forgot what year, but there was one year a while back where you guys were, uh, had a chance at the overall and, and didn't do it. What's the story with that, looking back? It, 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 you know, we've had, we've been there, we did that at Daytona in 2001, okay? We came very close in 2000. We accomplished it in 2001, winning overall. And that's usually circumstantial. Right. And it occurs in, in, in the current day cycle of this, which maybe started in 2000, not just our cycle, but I mean the cycle at Le Mans. Where, where we've increased manufacturer interest. You know, the LMP1 class gets born out of the GT1 class. You've got manufacturers participating. You know, in the early days of that, everybody was fledgling and trying to figure out what they were going to do. Racing there and, and, and running for 24 hours is no small task. So the, the fact that we were there and, and, and running for that overall victory was, A, I think a testament to, to, to our ability to provide a product in a team that's capable of that. But it also was the, the other teams in the, in the upper classes that were, that were new and struggling to get their product together. So it wasn't that we were a whole lot better than they were or faster. It was just a set of circumstances. At Le Mans, it's 25% great team, 25% great car, and 50% good fortune. And without that good fortune part, you've got no chance. We have, we've lost races there, not having good fortune, and we've won just as many with good fortune. Last year was a perfect example of that. You know, we lose a car on Thursday night. We're only going to go with one car. You know, we focus all our efforts on that. The guys stand up and, and, and do the right thing, everybody working together. You know, there's three hours left in the race. 
We're running number two. Ferrari's leading. Weren't you down a couple of laps at, at one, one point? point? Yes, we, and we battled back. I mean, but that I mean, slowly gaining, but wasn't totally clear how it was going to work out. Yeah. So so now we're, we're we're on the same lap, okay? And we got three hours to go. And you can do the math. You know how many laps you can run in three hours, which, by the way, at Le Mans is not that many laps. And if you're 30 seconds behind, which we were, okay, in the time we had meaning with the amount of laps we had left, we would have to be about a half second a lap faster than the Ferrari on every single lap. And that wasn't happening. We, were not, we weren't capable of doing that. So what do you do? You, we've been there enough. You hunker down, all right? You just push harder on the thing. You run just every lap as if it's your last. Every two remaining pit stops have to be executed perfectly. Ferrari has a transmission failure with about two hours left. And we inherit the lead, and we win. That's a great team, great car. That's 50% good fortune. <laughs> right. That's how it works. We've been in that exact position and had it work against us as well. So, Doug, what's amazing to me is how these 24-hour races, sure, they're endurance, but they've almost become 24-hour sprints, and the cars can take it. In the old days, you couldn't do that. You know, you'd, you'd have to sort of bide your time. You'd have to baby the car. Maybe the last few hours, you'd start to push if you had a chance of going it. What's been the key to getting these cars to last so long? You have touched on exactly the case, and I'm going to share something here that I don't normally share because I don't want to give the other guys the advantage. You go back and you look at films of the early Le Mans races, and when a car came in for a pit stop, the driver got out, took off his little leather helmet and goggles, went over, sat down at a little table just like this, lit up a cigarette, had a glass of wine, <laughs> checked to see how they were doing on the car. Oh, they had it fueled up. They put some new tires on. He'd take that last slug of wine, last drag on the cigarette, put it out, get in the car, and he'd continue driving. Times have changed. Uh, the mechanical side of it is, I don't want to say it's a given, but everybody's got it pretty well figured out. And that's just through massive amounts of testing, finding your soft spot, you know, redeveloping the componentry and getting it done. So how do you, our secret is the people. This, like every other business, is a people business. How do you keep your guys, think about this, you know, those guys are there for probably 23 days, all right? Your whole crew, 23, crew. So 23 days. Your whole month. You, Just number, to get ready for the race. Number one, you're in a foreign country where you don't speak the language. It's different food, different people. No mom, no dad, no wife, no girlfriend, no brothers, no sisters, no pets, no corner bar. I mean, you got nothing. You know, you can live like that for two or three days before it begins to take a toll on your mental makeup. Mm. All right. I mean, I was fortunate and I'd been there before. I recognized how important the people thing would be. You saw the organization that we have with our food service. You saw the dining commons that is only allowed entry by team members. No media, no outside. That's their home away from home. Bringing Jimmy Schmidt in for the first six or eight years to help train our Belgian chef on how you prepare food that Americans recognize. All right, trying to create an environment that was as conducive to keeping their spirits up, their 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 physical capabilities up as much as you could during those 23 days is as important, if not more important, than the piece of machinery sitting in the garage. Race week, you go out on the track on Wednesday evening to practice. The last practice ends at midnight. By the time those guys are home and head on pillow, it's probably 2 a.m. They're back at that track at 7 a.m. the next day. So we're looking at maybe, if they're lucky, five good hours of sleep. That's on Wednesday night. We duplicate that on Thursday night. They're back on Friday, again with only five hours sleep, to completely rebuild those cars. Those cars are completely stripped down. All new corners put on, all new suspension components, brakes, engine, drivetrain, transaxle, Everything is stripped off. Whole new car is built. I try and get them out of there by about 8 o'clock at night. they got to be back at 6 a.m. on race day for a 9 a.m. warm-up and a 3 p.m. start. So you're operating on three days of maybe a total of 15 hours sleep before you start your final race day, which by the time that race ends is a 30-hour race, not a 24-hour race. That wears people down. You got to keep your people on top of it. That's the primary reason we've been successful. The machinery, we never take it for granted, but we've got that figured out. It's your people that win that race for you. 
That's pretty impressive. That's really interesting. That, that's some good insight. Yeah, hopefully you didn't give away too much of the secret. No, no, I mean. <laughs> All right. So you're heading out, what, in just a few days, right? I, I leave on uh, Sunday the 28th or 29th. Okay. So a week about, from this coming about, Sunday. About a week from now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the guys will come out on uh, Tuesday. So I understand, you know, you, you, you just described uh, starting the Wednesday before the race, everything mm -hmm. that's going on. Why be there for 23 days, a whole another 20 days ahead of that? Well, here's, here's how that works. It, it, in the old days, which was 20 years ago, the test days would actually be in late April, early May. So you'd have to ship all your stuff over. You'd run for two days testing. Then you go back home and you don't come back over till June. Well, for us, it's not bad if you're residing in Germany, okay, but when you're in the U.S., that's a huge expense. So we always had, myself and, and other team members, you know, from manufacturers, had me, I said, you know, why, why do we do this? I said, what do you guys think about running a, a three-week segment where we come over and we work and run for a week, and then there's a week off, and then we have race week? I said, in that week off, from a marketing perspective, you have the opportunity, if you have new models to introduce, much like what Ford is going to do this year, you've got a bunch of marketing opportunities to go on. You can fill this, backfill this with a lot of stuff. The cars only have to go one time. You only have to set the garages up one time. You only have to set your hospitality up one time. And we can get this done with just one big swing. And they looked around at each other and said, you know what, that's, that's a pretty good idea. All the manufacturers agreed, lo and behold, okay, the following year, we go do that. That's why we're there for that period of time. Now, how that works is our guys will go over, we'll run that first week. All right, we get the cars ready, we go through a primary scrutineering, preliminary scrutineering, and then, and then uh, we're on track for a couple of days. Then, on that, it's Sunday, the following that Sunday, the guys will work on the cars, get them buffed up again, and then they have that week off. So I encourage them to do things. The, the, these are people whose lifestyle wouldn't necessarily allow them, nor would they have ever generated any interest in seeing any place but home. Okay? So now you're in Europe. You're within, you know, six, eight hours driving time or a couple hours train ride of some pretty interesting things. And what we've done is try and give them that week off as a European vacation. So they'll, they'll, they'll group up. And some will go, you know, one year they went up to Denmark to visit Jan Magnussen. Some will go over to the beaches in Spain. Some go to the south of France. Somebody always wanted to go to Germany. So they'll pack up, get in the cars, and they'll go drive and or fly to wherever they want to go over there. They'll take that week off, okay? Again, getting down to this mental aspect of this race gives them an opportunity to take that brain out, get it scrubbed up, and get ready to come back for that race week. That's why we're there that long. It's, it's a much better plan than what it used to be. The going and coming back and huge money and big problems. Yeah. This is way better. Hey, good. Uh, we've, we've got some questions coming in already. Uh, Carmen, uh, we've got a, a question or a, a phone call here. It looks for, like from Delmont, Pennsylvania. Let's bring that one in. Uh, this is Clem Zorowski at Delmont, Pennsylvania. My question for Mr. Feehan is, does the C7R engine use direct injection, port injection, or a combination of both on the C7R race cars? Thank you. The C7R utilizes direct injection, and it's, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it two-stage. We have injectors located at the top of the intake stack and at the bottom of the intake stack. And depending on where we are on the power curve, it energizes those two series of injectors. Yeah, interesting. That because uh, some, I think on the Acura NSX, aren't they using both port and? Uh, yeah, a lot of road cars use it for and mostly for emissions. Use both right. port and direct. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, we got another one. Steve B here says, "Is there a particular time during the 24 hours when you're most nervous or concerned?" You know, I, I would have to go go back to answer it. Go back to our early days there. In my world today, there's really no time when, when I feel that. And that's, that's just a feeling having confidence in your people and having been there before. 
Um, obviously, you always get a thrill when the cars are on that pace lap. And, and at Le Mans, it's a very ceremonial thing. It's unlike anything we have here. The pageantry, pomp and circumstance that takes place before these races begin is extraordinary. And there's huge speaker systems that blaring out, uh, you know, theme music, like the theme from Rocky, as the cars are coming down for the green flag. I mean, it's, it's emotional. It's emotional when they drop that. After that, it's pretty much business, and no, that that then you're fully focused till you get to that last hour, and 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 on the eight occasions that we've won, you are there's nothing left in your tank. You are emotionally and physically and mentally drained, which causes you to lose total control of your emotion. Mm. So when that checkered flag drops and you should a finish the race, but b finish on the podium, c finish on the top step. There is not a person in that pit box that is not broken down in tears. You can't, you can't help it. You, you have no control over it. It just washes over the top of you. It's an amazing feeling. So beginning and the end. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, George from Sunnyvale says, please talk about the engine air inlet restriction and its effect on horsepower and engine displacement. Does air inlet restriction change when you run the 24 hours of, of Le Mans? Yes, the, the, the Le Mans rules and the uh, WeatherTech series rules, the IMSA rules here, are slightly different. We run a different restrictor in the U.S. than we run in France. Uh, it's, it's not a huge difference, but it's a difference that requires additional dyno time to maximize the efficiencies. Obviously, the engine can only produce as much power as the amount of air it can take in. That controls the... Uh, the amount of the charge, the intensity, the explosion that takes place in each cylinder. So uh, we're running a five and a half liter engine. I don't know what the, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 29 millimeter restrictors. There's two of them. We'll put it in terms about the size of a half a dollar. And that keeps us right around the 500 horsepower mark, which, which allows us then to not have a distinct advantage over the other guys that there's nobody there that builds a streetcar that, that gets 650 horsepower, so we can't go in with that. We, they try and keep it 500 horsepower for safety reasons, safety for the participant, safety for the fan, and in addition, they have to balance between the four classes of cars. Mm -hmm. So with, with that 500 horsepower, we're tickling 190 miles an hour down the Mulsanne, which is plenty fast enough. Are they the going to change that for 2017 in either... ACO or, or IMSA the, for the, the power levels or the restrictor? That's something that, that's it's looked at every year. And, and the reason they look at it is the last reason that I stated, and that's to keep the proper differential. You know, with, a, with the GTD cars are, are getting faster, so we have to have the ability to be able to run faster than the GTD cars, but not so fast as that we're encumbering the LMP2 cars. And because they have two different racing characteristics, you know, the LMP2 cars have tremendous acceleration to them, okay, because they're very, very lightweight, and they have a little better braking. At top speed, we can sometimes, we're a little bit faster than, than they are. So it creates a dynamic on the racetrack that's quite challenging, and they work very hard to make sure there's a, uh, an equal uh, distribution of speed between those four classes. That gets looked at every year. Okay, we got another question here from a guy named Jim Campbell. He says, no, not Jim Campbell from Corvette Racing. Thank God he's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I had the opportunity to meet Ron Fellows. I was talking to him about physical training requirements. Can you talk about the physical demands? What do your drivers go through? You know, when, when you look at our, our core four guys, you're looking at guys who are literally marathon trained. They compete in marathons, whether they're full marathons or half marathon, marathons. They incorporate cycling into what they do. They are pretty intense physical specimens. When they're only working, pick a number, 50 or 60 days a year, you got a lot of free time on your hands. And they spend a lot of it in their personal training because number one, they want to succeed. We want to have them succeed. And they know that the physical demands in the car are extreme. Nobody wants to get out of a two hour stint and feel like that's the last thing they can do today. They want to get back in that car. So they have that common goal. They have that built-in drive to succeed. So physical training and diet plays a major role in their day-to-day -day life. They are athletes. They are athletes. I mean, these guys, I mean, Oliver's 
I, I think he's getting ready to run the London Marathon again and has done that. Antonio gives him a run for his money. When we were in Long Beach, we were then heading down to Laguna. The guys stayed after, brought their bikes, and they biked uh, up and down the ocean in, in some massive climbing mountain stuff, doing workouts, uh, you know, and still having fun. But, but nonetheless, that was, you know, they could have been doing anything. They could have been laying on the beach getting a suntan. They're out cycling and, and working out and getting ready for the next race. So it's a it's huge physical demand on these guys. Temperatures in that car can get up to 140, 150 degrees. Wow. There's a lot of work going on there. We have air conditioning for them now, which we started in, in, in this series. We were the first guys to do that. Now it's mandatory. Uh, but nonetheless, when you think about it, it's not just like a NASCAR thing where you're in, introducing about five degrees of steer and, you know, your ankle's getting sore because you had to press on the throttle all the way. You know, this is upshifting, downshifting, turning right, turning left, mashing on the brakes, back on the accelerator again. Not only looking out your windshield, you got to be in your rearview mirror because you got cars coming up on you that are much faster than you as well. So you're driving both sides of the vehicle. It's pretty intense, so you've got to be fit to be able to do it. How many stints will any one driver do during the race? Well, it, it, it depends on the timing, the weather, and, and a lot of different things. Ordinarily, we try and have them do a minimum of two stints. The car will run for about an hour on a tank of fuel. So when it comes in for fuel, we'll put tires on it every time. Uh, and if it's really, really hot out, we've had situations where we've changed on an hourly basis. We had one year where the temperatures were in excess of 100 degrees. Um, but ordinarily, two would be the minimum. They'll, three will be the, at a time, and then we just rotate through. So, you know, you've got essentially 24-hour race, so you've got a window of opportunity of t stopping 23 times, at a minimum, okay, unless there's huge amounts of yellow. So you divide that up amongst the three guys, and, and, and it usually comes out pretty equal. Mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons I'm asking this is it just hit me as you were talking. You know, uh, Indy cars will be coming to a race on Bell Isle. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they do a double header, a race on Saturday mm -hmm. and a race on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And almost invariably, the drivers talk about, oh, my gosh, we've had to do two races. And, you know, <laughs> we just raced yesterday, and now we got to do a race today. And, and you're talking about multiple stints. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. the same race. I, I can tell you that if you have the mentality that racing for 90 minutes on one day and then having to race 90 minutes, that's not a mentality that's going to go very far at Le Mans. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you look at, 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 at Simon Pagino, who two years ago drove for us. Oh, really? At I Le Mans. Yes, that. absolutely. Great guy. We've had, he had a great time, did a wonderful job for us in that car. And, and, and that's where I first met Simon. It was at 24 Hours. His, his Le Mans. So I know that these, these, these IndyCar races are walking apart for him. It's kind of like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> three laps at your local racetrack. He started out the IndyCar season red hot. I mean, yep. either wins or comes in second so far yep. in the yep. season. But you guys have started out red hot. Mm -hmm. You won at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Right. You won at Sebring. Yes. You should have won at uh, uh, <laughs> at Long Beach, Long right? You got yes. taken out by Porsche. Yeah. The, the call came from Stuttgart, right? <laughs> I, I, it, it's best to allow each viewer to look at that and come to their own conclusion. You guys have been surprising. Well, I don't know, surprising, but you guys have been pretty civil about that. There isn't really as much trash talk as you'd hope for a rivalry. Well, you know, everyone knows a rivalry exists. You only have to go back to maybe 2006 or seven at Laguna with uh, York Burmeister taking out Jan Magnussen coming down the front stretch, the final stretch, the checkered flag at, at Laguna Seca. And that, that Porsche... That was a horrific accident, yes, too. That, a testament to the safety build in that car. That, was, uh, that, that wreck in any other vehicle would have had a much different outcome. Um, so that pretty much kicked off the rivalry. All right, and, and those things, certainly not at that level, but those rivalries can be reasonably healthy. Um, you know, we've been around this for a long, long time. We know, we know we really don't have anything to prove to anybody. We think we've established our credential. And part of that is that we try and be pretty good citizens, both on and off the racetrack. We know we have the largest fan following of any manufacturer in the series. 
So it doesn't behoove us to get down into it when it's apparent to everyone exactly what happened. You know, I like the fans to come to their own conclusions, and, and I, I have to say I, I do enjoy the, the, the back and forth that exists in electronic media today where they have a chance to vent and express <laughs> their side of it. And, and, that, and that goes for our competitors as well. You know, that, that race in and of itself, for those who watched it, it was, it was evident as to what took place. And it was evident to the Porsche fans, it was evident to Corvette fans. And if you looked at the dialogue that took place between the two, you can see where the Porsche guys weren't particularly proud of what, of, of what took place. And, um, you know, I, I let the Porsche guys comment on it because I thought it was appropriate that, that they do. And, you know, Stuttgart had one individual who had his own opinion. The drivers are what really matter. And, and I think their drivers said the appropriate things and, and kind of to their fans made it clear that that's something that uh, probably didn't bode well for you being a Porsche fan or the Porsche car company. So there was no necessity for us to pile on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've been, we, we have a long view on this. We've been here a long time. We plan on being here a long time after this. So one race, one race can define you on the negative side. It never really defines you on the positive side. So we choose to, to let that go. We don't want to be that guy. I like that approach. I like what you're doing there because you're absolutely right. You know, uh, as, Especially uh, race drivers can come across as whiny crybabies, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and racing teams can come across that way. So I, you guys are taking the absolute right approach. Yeah. Take the long view. We, 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 you have to. That's something I instituted early on in this. You know, the, the, the temptation to look at the world th through a short lens is pretty great. But as I tell them, this, this isn't our last race. All right, we've got many, many more. You know, we're at... That's not their last race either. Right. We're at 99, we're at 99 victories right now. That would have been our 100th victory, right, which made it all the more painful. But like I said, I think we've established our guys in the true form and shape of what sports car racing always was. It's different than another form of racing because it's, I don't want to overstate this, but a gentleman's sport. We're all in, we live in a f very small world. And, and I like to say we're all in the same boat trying to make this this road racing thing succeed here in North America. We just have a different oar. So we all need to keep paddling in the same direction. I, you know, having a duke out in the pit lane would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure our guys would have been most accommodating. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll leave that to NASCAR. We'll leave that to NASCAR. That's great. Hey, we got a couple of other questions, sure. and they, they, they came in. We, we should get to them. Armand wants to know, is Corvette Racing still using augmented reality? I, 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 I would have to say I have no idea what augmented reality is. I, I think what he's referring to is you guys introduced some technology. If, if I've got this right, uh, where... You know, you don't just have rear view mirrors in your cars. You got a screen that's identifying who's coming up. It's a radar system. Okay. That, that Pratt Miller developed uh, in conjunction with Bosch. Mm -hmm. We use we Bosch developed a radar controller that that has the ability to look out back and identify objects. But it was an, they used it to, to vibrate a seat in a Cadillac, All right? That a car, that a car is coming up behind you. Or it's in your blind spot. There's the same basic sensor as blind spot warning in a road car. Yeah. Yes. We saw that as an opportunity, writing the right programs and algorithms for it, to maybe expand that. So we went to Bosch, which we already have a good working relationship on. We're in the same geographic area. We explained, at, we being Pratt Miller, explained uh, what they wanted to do. And, and Porsche said, you know what, I have at it. So that's, that, that was a proprietary device, by the way. It's not something they sell to anybody. So they gave us the device. The guys worked on it for over two years and came up with this radar system, augmented reality. Um, well, I think he's getting augmented because it identifies different yes, cars of yes, different classes. Yes. And whether they're well, closing on you or dropping back. That's correct. And it, it assigns a value to that with a, with a graded 
marker on your screen. There's a scale on the side. It tells you how far back the car is. It tells you whether it's traveling faster, slower, or same speed. And then as it approaches, it makes the logical decision on to which side the car is going to pass. And it alerts the driver on that, on that whole thing. So yes, we are still using that quite successfully. The drivers have become very dependent on it. And it is probably our single most valuable tool at the 24 hours of Le Mans. Okay. Is that something unique to your team? It's unique to our team, although it is available to other teams, all right? There were a couple teams that have it. I don't know to what extent now. Part of the agreement was when we got it done, Bosch would market it, and Bosch is marketing it right now. So it's available, to, and as far as I know, it's available to any team that would want to buy it. Armand, I hope we were talking about the right thing uh, regarding your question. Okay, one, one more question here. Speedy Stick says, with the Corvette being very popular in NHRA drag racing, any chance it would make an option for nitro or alcohol funny car racers? Well, you don't deal with that, do you? I, you it, that, that falls well outside my, my bailiwick. So, um, you know, we do have a we do have a quite successful drag race program that goes on. I, I don't I don't know when we're, when we're referring to Corvette and drag racing. I'm not sure whether he's talking about production class drag racing or whether he's talking about cars that have a Corvette body on them. You know, um, right now. From a marketing perspective, Corvette doesn't fall under the drag racing umbrella. We use road racing to promote Corvette, mm -hmm. and Camaro pretty much is our brand that we use, we use in drag racing. So it's, it's unlikely that we will see Corvette enter into the drag racing world on any level. Okay, this always happens when we start to ask questions. Even more questions start to come in. Mitchell says, wants to ask Doug if he owns a Corvette. Doug has owned many Corvettes in his lifetime. He currently does not. Okay. He owns a uh, Chevrolet Equinox. <laughs> Remembering <laughs> that I live in Michigan, <laughs> that all-wheel drive feature, yes, no, I don't, but, but that's, that's not for wanting one. It's just uh, the amount of time I'm home versus cost versus drivability versus weather suggests that I, I belong in Equinox for right now. Okay. Uh, Morgan wants to know, which transmission is being used in the C7R, and is there an advantage between a manual or an automatic in a 24-hour race? Well, everybody runs, for lack of a better term, a, a manual transmission. The gearbox we use is produced by X-Track, and, and in its basic form is the same gearbox that's used by everybody for the most part. All right, That's a universal usage. There is some refinement to the casing to fit our design, but the internals are, are pretty much the same. And, uh, you know, the, the, the transmission is shifted by paddle shift, which is a manually induced transmission, but requires no use of a clutch. So it's kind of a quasi-automatic transmission. I can tell you in the production car, when we move to our, our highest performance model, the Z06, which is a 650 horsepower, 650 foot-pounds of torque, that does a 0 to 60 time of 2.95 seconds, and that is achieved with the, the automatic, in other words, the paddle shift car, not the manual shift car. And you only have to look to our new Camaro, which we just introduced. I forget the nomenclature. We use ZL1 or whatever yeah, we're calling right. that. Yep. That has the new 10-speed automatic transmission. So those are fa And that transmission is about 25% faster on its shift time than the dual-clutch Porsche. Yeah. So I think that's a very definitive answer to a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. Hey, you got any other question there? Uh, uh, well, you know, you've said you've had a few Corvettes. If you get one back, which one would it be? You know, my, my favorite had to be my first one. I had a 1972 Corvette, which was bone stock. I got it with no air conditioning just because I wanted the highest performance. It was all I could afford. I bought it from Roger Penske. I paid $5,100 for it, brand new, off the showroom floor. At, that car brought me as much happiness, joy, thrill, fun that I think I've ever had in a vehicle because I was just a, a young man, and it was a real stretch for me to get that. I can remember, I was just saying this, I'm flashing through my mind. I remember pulling out of the dealership in that bad boy, parking it in the driveway. I think I wore out three rags a month waxing that thing. <laughs> so that, that was my favorite. That's great. Doug Fian, it's been awesome having you on the show. It's uh, so good. You're, you're, you, you make the whole Corvette racing experience come alive. 
uh, you embody what it's all about. What I especially like is you guys are just down the road here in New yes. Hudson. You know, you're our local. You got Ford's there too, and I love what Ford's doing, and I'm I'm so pleased to see them back. Uh, but as you know, that's not being done right here in our hometown. You guys are. I, I wish you the best of luck. I hope you go over there and just kick ass again. Well, thank you, John. You know, it's always a pleasure coming on here. I love dealing with our fan base. I, I love trying to bring new fans into the fold. We know at Corvette Racing that every time we go out, we're writing another chapter in a, in a long, long book that people will be looking back on this long after we're gone and looking at what we've accomplished. And, and uh, obviously, we're, we're homers. We, we, we love this whole Detroit scene. This whole Made in America is, is a pretty important part of it. You know, from Bowling Green, Kentucky, where the cars are built, right up here to where the race shop is. Um, Corvette, I think, really represents all the greatest things about America. Yeah. Thanks again. You bet. And we'll have you back. And I will, we'll be following the 24 <laughs> hours of Le Mans and seeing how you We love having you guys as fans. Cool. Right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break right here. Mike and I will be talking about some of the other things that have been going on in the business this week, the industry. So uh, hold tight. We'll be back in just a moment. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. I love that guy. I, I, I think Doug is just something special. Yeah, I mean, it's full of stories, and it goes back a long, long time. And we were talking about 70s Trans Am and all the history. He knows all the people. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he really has. So what, what have you been up to lately? Have you been out on any trips, any uh, media launches, any new cars you've been in driving lately? Uh, none, none that spring to mind immediately. I am going on the, the Volvo trip soon. So it's our first crack at the S90, mm -hmm. um, which is beautiful. So we just had a design review here in Detroit. So you, we saw it like you know in a room, kind of on its own, and I mean, they're making really pretty cars now. They are. And, and they're, they, I think they said they put $9 billion into, like, the total restructuring of Volvo as a brand, which is a ton of money. You know, like, that's, I think they said, like, GM spends $8 billion total in a year. I mean, the Volvo is spread out over years, but just the scale but it's of it. such a smaller company. A small than company. Yeah, right. And, and, I mean, that's, that was one of the big news things today was Tesla decided, like, hey, wait, we need some money. And they, they're, they're spending $2 billion just on one car. Um, you know, Volvo's, it's that kind of scale, billions of dollars. Yeah, what I'm really impressed about, and I, I love the look of the car, too, totally agree with you. They're clearly moving the brand way up scale. They're going after Mercedes, Audi, BMW, and the like. And what I'm reading into that is, number one, they probably should. Their, their production scale's not that great, so if you can charge more money, of course, it makes sense to move it up scale. But now I'm starting to think that's to let Geely come in at a lower level. So Volvo being, you know, the luxury brand, if you will, for Geely, which now owns uh, Volvo. Yeah, and they have a new, uh, they showed their compact cars, the concepts, this week. And it's a, it's a different architecture than the, the XC90 and the S90, but it's also scalable. Like everyone, everyone's making this scalable technology, so you have the same basic front and rear suspension components, and you can size them up and down a little, and then the room in between you can stretch. But that's also going to be used on Geely cars globally. And since it's engineered for every market, it opens the door to say, hey, wait, maybe Geely is going to come here eventually. Yeah, and you know who's d designing all Geely's cars right now? Peter Horbury, who used to design Volvos and, you know. And Fords. And Fords, exactly. And I'm not sure what all else earlier in his career, too. But I, uh, I just saw a couple of the, the new Geely's over at the Beijing Auto Show last month. Peter took me around showing that stuff and... Geely's going to be a player, and, and not just in China. So you, you mentioned this uh, in one of your uh, radio updates, that it's not, they're getting away from, like, the terrible, hilarious knockoff Yeah, the Chinese manufacturers are? That, that was one of my takeaways from the Beijing show, is that uh, the Chinese are really starting to step up their game. And, you know, especially for the independent, you know, there's, there's two types of car companies in China, essentially, one that are owned by governments, 
usually city governments. So you have the Shanghai Automotive Industry Company, you have the Beijing Automotive Industry Company, you have the Guangzhou Industry Company, um, and then you have the independents like Geely and Cherry and Great Wall. Those are the ones I say keep an eye on. So Geely said, look, you know, they, they admitted to themselves, our cars suck. You know, we got to get somebody in here and who knows what they're doing. So they brought in Peter Horbury. Uh, Cherry did the same thing. They brought in a guy named James Hope, Canadian, uh, spent a lot of time in Europe, uh, uh, you know, been with GM. I think, I think he did stuff with BMW, too. I, I shouldn't say because I'm not uh, especially sure, but he's transforming the looks of their cars, too. So their quality's getting better, their technology stepping up, their styling is definitely a, a, a zillion miles ahead of where they were just five years ago. So they're, they're going to be players on the... Uh, you know, we tend to say, oh, you know, wait till the Chinese start to go out and around the world. That's only because we here in Europe and the United States don't see Chinese cars. You go just about anywhere else in the world, maybe not Japan, but... Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, the Middle East, that Chinese cars are everywhere. So uh, I just got back from driving the Acura NSX, and uh, this was my first crack at the car. I got to drive it at Lime Rock and out on the road. Really liked it, but uh, in talking with some of our colleagues, you know, it's they're not that impressed. I, I drove it in the fall, and I was one of the few people, I think, that liked it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's a strange car because it doesn't, it doesn't give you a lot of steering feel. My, my one complaint that I think is pretty legitimate was it doesn't give you a lot of brake feel. It has, the, has one of the most amazing brake systems in the world. Like, you, you know, you, you go into a corner, and you're like, this is way too fast. I'm not going to make it. And you hammer on the brake pedal, and you're like, oh, my God, this is going to do it. Like, Did you have the ceramic brakes? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but you, you don't really, if you lose the brake, if you go too far and you get into ABS, the, the, at least the one I drove, they might have changed it. It was an early car. It doesn't pulse back like a usual ABS system. So it was kind of hard to judge because, uh, you, again, you're not getting much, much steering feel through the wheel. It was kind of hard to judge when you, when you could get the brakes back, that, stay on that threshold. But overall, I, I think a lot of people didn't like it because it, it doesn't have a lot of steering feel and it, it uses the hybrid to, to supplement the power, which makes for this totally seamless transmission, which is great, but it kind of dampens the other stuff. The thing about the NSX that I enjoyed was all of that was intentional. They knew what they were doing. They said, we're, we're going to change things. We're going to raise up uh, what's capable of the car, part of it by using those front motors, kind of like a Porsche 918, and we're going to lose some things along the way. And we're okay with that because that's what our goal is. So uh, the, the thing I liked about it, besides the fact that it's really easy to drive, it's got all this performance, it was uh, they succeeded in their vision. But, I mean, I think you said it's like it's the car your grandma could drive, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, well, I said my mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, look, I liked it, especially liked it on the track. And, you know, you got different settings, you know, quiet mode, sport mode, sport plus, and then track. And then track mode, the car really does come alive, uh, certainly audibly. I mean, the exhaust noise really becomes far more pronounced. And it's a car that... Uh, because it's so easy to drive, it inspires a lot of confidence. You know, next lap you go, okay, I'm going this much deeper into the turn. I'm getting on the power this much uh, sooner. And, and every now and then that can come out and almost bite you, but then the car, you know, quickly takes control. And, you know, I never went off into the weeds with it. But we were honking around the track. I mean, we were moving. And, and it still has this Honda-ness to it, right? Like you mentioned quiet mode which they, uh, they had benchmark cars that they were all driving, like a Ferrari was one of them in particular. And the engineers were saying, you know, I, I leave for work at 5.30, 6 a.m. You fire up a Ferrari, it's waking up neighbors. Uh, you know, the, the, the quiet mode they envisioned, if you're, you know, if, if you're in a neighborhood, or it's just for, you know, starting up and pulling out onto the street and getting away. And, and they actually kind of said, you know, that's just what it's for. It's not really for driving. It's not a hybrid mode. And everyone that drove it was like, this is great. Like, you're in the city. You can turn the engine down. You don't have to hear it. Um, but to me, that's like this particular Honda thing where, like, you know, we've got 600-plus horsepower, and we're, we're building a yeah. supercar. But we don't want to offend <laughs> the neighbors. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The, the other thing that I like was their launch control. And I, I've been in launch control in, or used launch control in a lot of other performance cars. But this was, was really different because of the hybrid system. So, you know, you put it in track mode, you put your foot on the brake, you mash the gas pedal, uh, then a sign comes up, a little, you know, uh, thing on the, the dash that says, okay, boom, you know, pop your foot off the, uh, off the brake and, and you'll take off. 
and you get like this kick in the ass and the car just leaps forward like a foot or two then the engine revs up and so it it's it's kind of a cool experience of getting this instant acceleration and yeah i think the engine's at like 2500 rpm when you you, know, you snap your foot off the brake but but the car just leaps forward then the engine revs up so it's a very different uh, experience in doing launch control yeah and it, it's it's fast i i was kind of i was a little bummed out with launch control cuz it was it's uneventful like there's no you know you have that you have that initial surge and then, it, like, it, it, everything else is smooth, you know? There's no wheel spin. Right. There's no, like, you know, cracking between the gears because it uses those motors to fill in the gear shift, uh, in, in between the gear shifts. You know, when you notice it, it's standing outside of the car. So yeah. if you listen to other people do launch control, they go get through a couple of shifts, and there's this nice pop. It's kind of a muffled pop, but uh, the, the launch control actually sounds better standing outside of the car than sitting in the driver's seat. And then that I did not expect. <laughs> So uh, what else uh, going on? What do you make of all this uh, Mitsubishi, Suzuki, cheating on gas, uh, or fuel economy ratings? I, I mean, and, and Opal is now possibly might have used a cheat device. It's, it's like who's... Who's next? It, well, not who's next. It's, it's, it's like Tour de France racing. Like, all of a sudden, there have been enough people that have, you know, invalid tests come up. You go, well, wait a minute, everybody's cheating, right? Uh, you know, and with Mitsubishi... Uh, you gotta wonder if this is like some master plan by Gone, right? He, <laughs> he gets, he outs, Mis not he, but his company outs Mitsubishi, the stock falls, and then, oh, lo and behold, the people that, the people that blew the whistle on him are gonna come in and save the day. Wow. Take over the controlling stake. Of I the like car. the way you think. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, why not? Because, you know, Mitsubishi makes over a million vehicles a year, and, uh, so that's a nice chunk of volume to add to the Renault Nissan. And yeah, and they build a they build a, a lot of K cars, which is I think something like forty percent. It's a huge part of, portion of the market in Japan, and they're strong in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, Nissan has a presence there too, but it yeah. doesn't hurt. Yeah, right, right. But I like that. Yeah. Hey, another thing, you, you and I are both on uh, North American Car and Truck of the Year jury, and now we've got to elect our officers. What do you think about that? Electing them. I think it's a good idea. It's. Um, you know, you get some, you, you populate up good ideas, new ideas, and change. Where not that there was anything wrong with. No, it's very it successful. I've only been on it for a year, so uh -huh. so far my experiences have been positive, and I I wouldn't dare malign anyone who gave me a negative experience. Cause <laughs> what if I get kicked off? But, um, <laughs> but no, I think it's I think it's a good idea just to ensure long term continuity. You know, you look at you look at any sort of jury or organizing body like that and they they have it set up so that you can say this is the way we do things and if somebody needs to bow out uh they can do it and someone else can come in and, and keep it going yeah i i think it's very interesting it's certainly sparked a lot of debate amongst the jurors you know who are you going to vote for you know why should we vote for this person or that person yeah, so our, our car ballots uh, are, are publicly disclosed. This is a secret ballot, though, right? I think this is a, a good... Yes, it is a secret ballot, and I like that. I'm not going to divulge who I'm... I don't mind, and I think it's important to publish what jury members voted for which cars, how many points they gave in establishing the car and truck of the year. I think that's important to be very clear and transparent about it. But when you're voting for your colleagues, I know every one of these people, it's not an easy decision for me to say, I'm going to vote for this one, that one, or the other one. I've already done my voting, but uh, yeah, I'm glad they're keeping the ballot secret in this case. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, like I said, it's not an easy decision, and, I, and if the people I voted for do not win, it's not like it's going to kill me. But I do think it's smart for us to be able to elect who's running the organization. Right, and it's, uh, you know, it's set up, it's being handed off over a longer period of time. Was it five years, I think? Or oh, no, no, I don't... Uh, well, there's still a supervisory commi correct. committee to make sure that the transition to the elected officers occurs smoothly. Right, <laughs> right. That's right. No, I, I, I think the way that... Uh, the organizing committee put this together has been well thought out. Uh, I, I think it will be executed well, but uh, there's going to be some long faces uh, among some people when the results are posted. So we'll know soon. What else? Anything else catch your eye uh, of what's going on? I, I mean, I mentioned Tesla earlier. Uh, it's, it's kind of a joke. 
in our office because Tesla news comes up, people want to read about Tesla, and then you're, we're covering Tesla all the time. But they're, they're making news and they're interesting and there's a lot of questions about them. And one of them was a couple of weeks ago, everyone was like, they're never going to make it to 500,000 by 2018. That's crazy. And it is crazy. They don't have a second factory. The factory they have can't, the factory they have when Toyota ran it made 400,000 cars a year. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, you can never really, all of the bad things you can say about Tesla can never underestimate them. And, and lo and behold, people go, oh, it's unrealistic. They're not going to get the Model 3 to market on time. They're not going to be able to build it. And then it turns out, oh, they do have a plan. They're selling a bunch of stock so that they can get the, the capital to build this car. And, and so, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm not universally positive on Tesla, but it's fascinating the way that they keep finding ways to go because it's, it's really difficult to build a car. Tesla's, Tesla's actually further proof of that where, you know, they have – you know, quality issues that their owners forgive or production slowdowns that like, you know, cars are complicated and expensive and difficult to build. And yet you know, they're still surviving. So they're, they're still in the game. Yeah, they're, they're, they they want to raise two billion dollars. I'm sure they'll get it in no time. I'm sure it's not going to be an issue for them. I think existing shareholders may be a little miffed because it's already driving down the price of the stock because they're going to dilute the stock. Yeah, I mean, the, the stock is overvalued in terms of what Tesla, Tesla, you know, the value of the company and the value of, of their sales, it's grossly over. They're like, I think they have a bigger market cap than Hyundai. So, you know, some of that's a correction, but also you can't do that trick too many times. You know, you, right. you sell the stock once, your stock's going to drop a little. You do it a third or fourth time. Look, I, I'm very skeptical about them, but I truly want to see them succeed. Yeah, that's I, I my think take it's, too. It, it's important for a, somebody new to come along and start a car company and make a go of it. Uh, I, I like them trying to do it. Like I said, I'm still skeptical as to whether they're going to be able to pull it off or not. But so far, so good. You know, it's, uh, yeah, they've got issues. They've got, especially this Model X, looks like it's got a lot of quality problems, but that should be able to get straightened out. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's different approaches, right? Like, they tend to do some beta testing in the public, really, where they're working out the kinks. And they have, and they can do it right now because they're making something no one else makes. And they have, like I said, an a, a incredibly uh, positive fan base of owners. Um, you know, and then on the other side of it, uh, more traditionally of GM, that was another thing that came out today. They're, they're building the Bolt. The, the production schedule kind of leaked out. Uh, very quietly. It's coming in, I think, October. But they're also starting to, there's a partnership with Lyft. So they're gonna, there's going to be something that's yet to be determined where Lyft is like Uber, where people can drive people around as, as you know, a taxi car hire service. And then now it, they're putting autonomous test vehicles built up on the, vol on the Bolt. So it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty uh, outside the box for GM, I'd say. Very much so. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because uh, if we had talked, I'd say, five months ago, I would have said GM's not in the picture very much. I think Ford's way ahead of him in this whole move into mobility. Bang, bang. You know, they buy cruise automation. They make this big investment in Lyft. Now we're seeing autonomous electric bolts running around that could be Lyft cars. And it's like, yowza, uh, GM may be in the lead right now in this whole move to mobility. Yeah, and, I, you know, that's, that's the stuff that gets all the news. It's important to remember that, I mean, you, uh, you were mentioning it earlier this month, like electrified cars and hybrids is still this tiny portion of the market. But if you look at other industries like cable or, or beer, I mean, you know, craft beer is something like 2.5%, 3% of the beer market, and the big beer companies are freaking out. Same thing with cable. You know, if you get to... If you, if, you know, you can say, oh, this is only 10% market share. If you went to Comcast and said, you're going to lose 10% of your market share, they would freak out. <laughs> so I think the automakers are right in, in hedging and getting into the electrification no matter where it goes because there is some market for it. And there are people that are going to, in some scenarios, that w are willing to not own a car, do a car share or, or, you know, take rides. Well, you know, we're on the verge, especially when the bolt hits the streets, of having an affordable electric that's going to make a lot of sense for people because it's going to have the range. In fact, I just got a, a letter today from a viewer who took a screenshot from a Chevrolet's website where they're showing, like, uh, the information, gra information graphic that you can get on the Bolt. And it, uh, God, if, I'm, if I can remember, it showed 
in this graphic, it, it's showing how much energy you might use, and it showed that it used 18 point, I, I, do I have this right, 18.1 kilowatt hours, and the car drove just over 78 miles. So if you do the math, and I did right. the math, because it's got a 60 kilowatt hour battery, you do the math, and this would suggest the Volt could go 260, 60 miles on a charge. It, now, I don't know if this is just some propaganda BS that they had on the we website, but uh, I was intrigued by that. It, I mean, it depends on the... Oh, here's the graphic up right okay. now. They, it, it depends on the driving. I was in a Leaf recently. The, they, up, they updated it to a 30 kilowatt hour battery pack, and... Uh, in around town city errands, I was getting a projection of like 125 miles, and then I drove on the highway into work, and it 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 dropped significantly. It was still it adjusts the range prediction, but I was way ahead of the sticker for a while. And and the thing the thing about electric vehicles that I think people discount because you look at, you know, we're getting to an affordable price now. Whether or not the the car maker makes money on it is another question. But it, you know the like hybrids, they don't always pay off. They take a long time to pay off for the money for the technology. But there's this convenience part with EVs that I love. It's like you never go to the gas station. Yeah. Like you plug it in, every day you start with a full tank. And that takes away a lot of, okay, the tank's not as big, but you're like, I never, you know, you know the time when you're like, I'll do it in the morning. And then you're out of the work and you're like, oh, man, I don't have time for this. <laughs> right. No, I, I like driving EVs. I, I love how quiet they are. I like the instant response. I think there's, it's a different driving experience. And rather than trying to market these things as environmentally good, I would market them as, this is fun to drive. It's a different driving experience. And, and that's like, that's one thing that's lacking in a lot of cars is, is something unique that people are passionate about. You know, people, same thing, we're talking about it. They're quiet, they're quick off the line. It's this unique driving experience, and it's really fun. It's, in some ways, it's the same reason people drive a Wrangler. It's, it's old and backward and loud, but they're like, you know what, this thing, this is cool to me. And to a lot of people, EVs are cool to them. I think it, more people will find that, too. Yeah, and that's interesting. I hadn't heard that, that they might be getting, getting the bolts out as early as October. I, it's definitely this year. Oh, I know, I know that. I, I think officially they've been talking about uh, December okay. as start of production. Now, that doesn't mean in the showroom, but if you're doing a start of production in October, you will have cars in the showroom before the year is out. Yeah. Cool. Mike, we ought to wrap it up here. But right. thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, no, no. Great having you, and, and especially for the discussion with Doug, because that was a lot of fun. And uh, I'll be watching the 24 hours. Yeah, me too. It was... Uh... Going there was a bucket list item. You yeah. got it, and then it changes you. You're like, years before I was like, oh, the race is on. I'll check in. And now this year, I think I'm going to try to watch as much as I can. Well, fortunately, they stream so much of it online. Exactly. You can watch an awful lot of the race. Cool. Well, thanks again. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion, and by Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.